what is the problem here? Well, the, sh the, sh the short of it is, and it's Elizabeth Novotny for the Vermont Police Association, um, the, the language that appears in Section B, A, uh, in the middle, is there a line here, B, A, it would be 12. This language, or should know, is what I want to just briefly talk to you about. So last Thursday when I spoke to the committee by phone, if you recall, I, I recommended that the committee not pass anything out that day and allow me the opportunity to work with the victims' advocates and law enforcement to bring to you language. I was not aware the committee was otherwise working on language, and so I, comm I be commenced that process with Kara Cookson on Friday. Uh, while I was traveling, I asked her uh, about the issue, and she referred me to the Washington State statute, told me to use that, so I did. And on Monday, sent language out to Kara, to the chiefs, uh, to Mike O'Neill, and to the sheriffs in an effort to try to bring you, a, essentially, language that had consensus. That was my goal, and that's what I uh, committed I would do for the committee. I was not aware you were otherwise working on your own language. So um, uh, I am aware, and, I, and I, I, I'm not sure what happened in the committee room yesterday, but I can tell you that I did email uh, Denise to let her know that I would be delayed. And uh, by the time I got here, you folks had, had finished up on the issue. So I did use Washington State's statute. Washington State statute is pretty much this language, except for the or should know. And I want to talk about that just very quickly with you. The statute that you currently have in Title 13, um, Section 3257, is the sexual exploitation of an inmate statute that's, that House Judiciary worked on actually while I was at public safety years ago. And it took a few years for them to get this through. Uh, and they landed with um, the requisite mental state as being knows. The officer knows. And that's what they developed uh, and, uh, in 3257. The language is essentially that no correctional employee, and I'll just skip the rest of it, uh, knows. Um, in other words, knows is the requisite mental state. You have to have knowledge. You have to know. And then they go on and talking about basically you can't have sex with an inmate or a person in the custody of corrections. So our request would be uh, that the or should knows be, be uh, stricken from this, that we stay consistent with current statute as it exists for sexual exploitation of an inmate in the custody of corrections. Uh, and we stick with no's, that language, uh, that, that request is supported by, um, well, Rick doesn't have a position, but everybody else you see here, the troopers, the chiefs, and um, the victim's advocates. And I was at least told on the phone yesterday that I don't, I'm not sure if anybody caught the or should no's, but um, uh, that is uh, a request that is supported by the chiefs. So that's it. Despite what we heard yesterday from the leader of the Chiefs Association, uh, I Chief think she, in Colchester. Yeah, I think she was wait. She was thinking out loud as she went through the language. But I, I talked to her subsequently, explained to her what is already in state statute. It happens. Um, I, I don't know what else to tell you. But I was in process of trying people to bring people to the table, and I did not come up with the Washington State language. I asked specifically of the victims' advocate community. What language do you want me to use? And I was directed to the Washington State language. And I want to just it, also let you know, I talked to Auburn Watersong from the uh, Network Against Domestic Violence, and Auburn supports the request to take or should knows out. So that is supported by both of the um, representatives of the victims advocate community. OK. Thank you. So we've got Jim. So essentially, Beth, you're, you're fine with that language with the exception if we crossed off or should know. Yes. We, and we did have that conversation in the committee, and I don't know if we quite resolved what that would mean. Um, well, as written, if you left that in there, you could conceivably convict someone of a criminal offense who had no actual knowledge and there was consent. So the, as I said, the, the whole object of statutes like this, which we support, by the way, is the notion that the person who is giving the verbal consent, who may actually technically be saying, I consent, 
is in a position of not, we, we, we create a legal fiction that they really can't consent by the virtue of their age, perhaps of their, um, their status as being a vulnerable adult, perhaps by their, the level of their intoxication would be another example. So the law creates this uh, perspective that under certain circumstances, people can't truly consent. So when you talk about um, the relationship of power and control, and that's what this is about, an officer has direct power and control over someone that officer is detaining, or that officer has in custody, or that officer is currently arresting. That's a direct power and control relationship. It's a little more attenuated when you're not that officer who is presently arresting someone, placing them in custody or arrest or, or uh, detaining them. However, if you are an officer who knows that, it's a little bit more attenuated, but you can arguably agree that that relationship exists. So we would support that language. But when you get into or should knows, now you're bootstrapping constructive knowledge to someone who may not actually have knowledge to um, uh, a consent argument where we're creating the legal fiction that there wasn't actually consent, even though there was. Does that make sense? Well, the officer's not consenting, supposedly consenting. The officer's supposed to know that individual X is detained, arrested, or otherwise in another officer's custody. In any case, Rob has a question followed by Dennis. We did have this conversation mm -hmm. yesterday, and my question to, I think it was Jennifer, was give me a scenario where somebody would be in custody mm -hmm. and a fellow officer would not know that to, to the point where sure. this would be an issue. Fair question. She couldn't give one. Well. Mm -hmm. Fair question. So um, having been a sex crimes prosecutor for seven years, let me see if I can give you an example. Um, the concepts of detention, arrest, and custody seem relatively simple, because I imagine everybody can picture someone's handcuffed in the back of a cruiser, someone's at the police station being processed for an arrest. That typically is what we come to, would come to mind. But in the law, on a day-to-day -day basis in the criminal justice system, judges are asked to determine whether a person is in custody or being detained or is under arrest under circumstances that aren't so classic. So uh, if I'm a law enforcement officer and <clears throat> I respond, um, well, it could be a fish concert. Let's say, you know, a massive concert like we had many years ago when fish had its final concert. Huge crowd control issue. But there were incidents that would break out occasionally at this, at this concert. So officers in trying to manage that might say, because there's a, a group in a kerfluffle, <clears throat> might, say to, uh, might say to you, for example, you wait here. I'm going to come back to you. Uh, I've got to go manage this. And then I'm going to start to figure out what happened. But I don't want you to go anywhere. And in that time period that passes, could be half an hour, could be an hour, you're hanging out and you end up having a sexual act with someone who's a police officer you might be dating. You could, well, <laughs> these things happen. <laughs> you could be there with your, with your girlfriend who's a police officer. You could, whatever the situation is, you are technically detained by a police officer. <clears throat> Under the law, that is a detention. And custody uh, can be arrived at. I think that the thinking is that we're all clear about no's. That's a specific intent. We, we, can, we can establish that. And a good investigator and a good prosecutor are going to be able to manage around that in, in trial. Or should know, uh, what does that require of an officer? That the officer conduct research before deciding to enter into a consensual relationship with somebody? Um, are, you, are you under house arrest? Are you, um, that is the, that is the thinking. And, and I'll let you know that if we have the support of the victim's advocates, I think you can reasonably consider taking that language out without much consequence, certainly not from their community. Well, that language in there yesterday, and they testified, didn't have any issues with language yesterday. I had a conversation with Karen. I'll let her speak for herself as to, yeah. So uh, Kara Cookson, Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Uh, if I could, so I mean, our position is that we we certainly don't object to removing this language to the extent that 
law enforcement feels like um, it's important to um, avoid situations that um, aren't wouldn't be wrongful and consensual situations. I mean, again, it was hard for me to imagine the hypothetical scenario, but some hypothetical scenarios have been offered um, that I think are not unreasonable. I mean, for us, obviously, we're going to advocate. And yesterday, we came in to advocate for the for a, a position that's going to be most protective to victims. That's my that's my job in the building, but with that said, I mean, law enforcement, are, they're a key partner for us. Um, the intention behind this language isn't sort of a gotcha, it's, it's really to prohibit wrongful conduct, and so we were open to the argument that um, the conduct described um, might, we could come into a situation where conduct that's not necessarily wrongful um, could be swept under. Um, and so we're open to this, and again, the Washington statute um, does not include the constructive knowledge element, so it's that's a that's a fair argument. Uh, for, uh, to be honest, I mean, I wasn't focused on the mens rea aspect of it. I'm, uh, my real focus in looking at this is the scope of the um, custodial element, and and we were we were satisfied with that as well. And it's consistent with your statute as it relates to corrections officers. So, so if we take out should know out of this, then we don't ever have to go back and revisit this language again this session. <laughs> right. Is that a commitment for everybody sitting in this room? Two weeks ago, I, I told you our organization yes no. supports this concept, and the answer, again, is yes. This was the only ask we had. Well, keeping in mind that yesterday we had agreement for everybody sitting in the room. And that lasted 24 hours. Um, Dennis? So we found it in other states, should know. I'm comfortable leaving it. I don't know how you would prove that they knew if he said, well, I, I even though I should have known, I didn't know. So how do you prove that? It happens all the time in criminal court. It is a standard that is uh, part of I can't remember, so many number of criminal statutes, but a good investigator and a good prosecutor prove that. It's also a standard that's used in their codes of conduct, so that's not an unusual standard and one that is proven daily in your criminal courts. So. Well, I'd rather leave it in myself. <clears throat> John and Warren. So Beth, if, if somebody's sitting in handcuffs, should, should an officer know that they've been arrested? I think you've proven that. If the officer sees someone in handcuffs, then that's... Well, it could be somebody else's handcuffs. You know, it could be, you know... Uh, uh, no, I'm playing your game, so don't... Well, don't it's not a game. So yeah. let me be very clear, I'm not playing a game. I'm not, and I don't want the committee to think that I'm here to play games. But having been a prosecutor, I wouldn't... With that fact pattern, if you were a police officer and you saw a person in handcuffs, in a cruiser? No, uh, not in a cruiser. Just, just in handcuffs? Just in handcuffs. Yeah, I wouldn't have a problem um, uh, bringing that case to a jury. Zip ties. Wouldn't have a problem bringing that case to a jury. Okay. Warren? I've actually spent a, a fair amount of time in the last mm -hmm. 24 hours thinking about this. and. Um, what we heard yesterday is is that it, it it would be very surprising to find an officer who should have known and didn't know. Uh, and the examples we used, and, and we used just again this morning, was uh, a fellow officer, um, a colleague. Somebody has somebody under detention, and a fellow officer, in all probability, would know. But I can, I understand the example Beth used of the fish concert. I actually hadn't come up with that one in my own mind, but I was thinking of things like maybe an officer, a police officer from a completely different agency happened to be nearby where somebody wasn't in handcuffs. Maybe even the person that the officer said, you wait here, I'll be back within the hour at the fish concert, and, and there's all kinds of officers from different agencies. Regardless of how improbable we may think that should know comes into play, I believe that it exists. I, I believe that somebody 
might have known or should have known but didn't. So I, I have I have some concerns about including it, but I will go I will go with the group. I don't know. Did I? No, I did call him. Yes. Yes, Cindy. I already went. Yeah. Cindy. I don't know if this is helpful or not to start rewriting it, but uh, when we have with a person who is the officer, would it be helpful to put, let's see, who is the officer or any other officer who is detaining in custody? You know, Could you make it? To say, okay, not only the officer, but other officers. If we added that language, you know what I'm line trying to get at. But, see, and I think it's addressed in your line 13 there. Okay. Or otherwise, or another officer. Uh, being detained, arrested, or otherwise held custody by another officer. But if we took that out, the second line, the um, wait a second, the second part, the part in question, and just had who the officer or another officer is detaining, arresting, or otherwise holding in custody. Period. I think that's blows up the should know further. Yeah, because that's just a letter. Just in any case in which an officer, any other officer is arresting, detaining, or holding in custody, it would be a per se felony for some other officer to engage in a sexual act with that person. I think it even goes beyond the should know. So just want to remind you, you have a criminal statute that your House Judiciary Committee worked on pretty extensively for a period of at least two years. And they stuck with and they went with no's. They did not have should have known. And they actually talked about these scenarios where you could be a correction officer in another part of the state and what kind of knowledge we would require in order to convict somebody. So I, 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 I think that law enforcement is simply asking that the standard they can be held to, the mens rea, the state of mind, be, be the same for police officers as they are for correction officers. So we've what, got, <coughs> this what's is the language? Up? Yes. Uh, what is the language that they have all no. figured out? No. Did you? We just delete what we should have. Oh, okay. In the Thank you. Language. I got it. I got it. <coughs> yes. Jim and then Dennis. I'm fine with taking out or should know. I do think it makes it cleaner, easier to prove. Um, you know, should know. I mean, a lot of things around this building I should know, and I don't, because sometimes I'm naive and focused in a different There's area. There's only so many times you can say that. I know. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Naive. Yeah. <laughs> I've been here 17 yeah. years, and it's true. There's, there's some things you just, you're just oblivious to it. You know, you're focused on something else. So, um, anyhow, I, I would be happy to take that part out. Dennis? So, or should know raises the bar. As far as I'm concerned, if you've got just knows, there's an awfully good chance they won't know. And I think that's uh, <clears throat> pretty easy to prove that you don't know. But should know raises the bar a little bit and uh, allows you to maybe go a little further uh, in the prosecution or whatever you're trying to uh, prove. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not going to die on my sword, but either way. But uh, I think uh, or should know, should be there. We, other states are using it. And I don't know if it's been a problem or not, but uh, I'm, I'm for leaving it in. But like I said. And bottom line, if ever we manage to get this bill over to the Senate, whichever we do, leave it in or take it out, the opposite activity could happen in the Senate. Mm -hmm. If we take it out, they can put it in. If we leave it in, they could take it out. So why don't we take a straw vote suggested by... Good idea. Good idea. Our what is vice the chair. Yeah. Yes, I didn't know whether to call him my... No, call. we're on camera. My... my oh, <laughs> <didn't mind. laughs> what what well, are you going to call me? Well, <laughs> something akin to the old married couple that you refer oh. to us as. <laughs> that's, that's, that's okay. The other part of the couple. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, so uh, those of us that are okay with leaving this language as is, could you just raise a hand? I'll raise a hand. I'm going to go forward. Yeah, all right. Those of you who would like to, those of us who would like to take out or should know, raise a hand, please. Okay. So, be thank you. Betsy, we're taking it out. Or should know is now history. 
may it remain so. <laughs> More than 24 hours. All right. Now the other issue that we need to deal with, hold the phone. Oh, oh, you're not going anywhere. All right. The other issue that needs to be revisited, and my apologies to folks who are starting to arrive for 281, we have had to dial back to what we thought we had finished at 830. So, sorry. And I'm sorry, I'll just need to be oh, you need to other, your other members of the committee. That's right, in five time. minutes, <coughs> yes, across oh, yeah. the hall. That's right. They need their own schedule. So, what's wrong with the membership of the council that we agreed to in a, a couple hours ago? So, uh, Madam Chair, Rick Goth here for the Criminal Justice Training Council. I apologize for bringing this back. For some reason, I thought that the committee was just going through and verifying what they had agreed on, would be taking testimony at a later stage. I would also note that I'm at a distinct disadvantage when it comes to hair on fire issues. So, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. so noted. So, <laughs> wow. So on the on the subject of council membership, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, when you look at expanding the council, there's a couple things you look for. You look for uh, a unique voice. You look for representation from a significant population and you look for decision makers uh, with those organizations. Uh, the council itself actually visited this language at its last meeting in March and had opposed adding the VSEA to uh, council membership. Uh, I think I've testified, I thought I testified to that down uh, earlier. Um, at the, if you look at the criteria that I just laid out, the VSEA doesn't meet any of those. They represent maybe 5% of law enforcement in the state. Uh, I think the law enforcement officers constitute maybe 2% of their total membership. Um, it's not a unique voice. We have organized labor representation um, on the council. And um, as we've learned in other processes, the VSEA rep isn't necessarily the individual who ends up making the decisions or the VSEA may not support the decisions that that rep has made in those committees. So that's it in a nutshell. Let me see if this is pertinent to what you just said. <clears throat> who sent the note? Me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just assumed. Um, that's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I do recall, on behalf of the committee, conversation about if we were going to have one, we should have both as far as labor representation. And we thought at adding public voices, adding... Well, the VSEA membership, those officers are well, represented... Well, the three, the three... Uh, right. VSEA, but then separately... The well, the, the three publics. Right, but the officers that work within that work for DMV, Fish and Wildlife, and liquor control. DMV and Fish and Wildlife already have seats on the council, so the representation on decisions the council makes that affect those agencies is already there. John and Cindy. I understand that the, the agencies may have seats, mm -hmm. but it's whether the employees have seats. And, and I think when you know the council starts taking on the decertification role, it's important that there be some balance between management and employees. And, and I mean, I think that's something you should think about. Um, we've heard in testimony some concerns about the makeup of the council for decertification purposes. So I, I, I think we may eliminate an issue if we keep them there, going down the road, but. Just an FYI. Yes. Mm -hmm. Cindy? I was, we're talking about the council membership. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's the beginning Not of the day. Okay. Um, John pretty much said what I was going to say. So. so ditto? Yeah, thank you. Anybody else from the committee? Uh, Marsha? Having um, a soft spot for the Department of Liquor Control, I would hate to see the 15 or 17 officers that work under that department not have any representation on this council. I guess, I guess I'm curious as to what 
the idea of representation on the council would entail? The, the, we're not at the council. Well, we've added, we've added Fish and Wildlife. DMV will have someone. Liquor control has been totally left out of the conversation. Liquor control has never petitioned for a seat on the council as an entity. Not since I've been there, and I'm not aware that they ever have. Um, I don't know that they've ever, I've never, well, let me back up. The last time I talked to the director of enforcement, the previous one, Bill Goggins, um, didn't indicate any desire to either be on the council, and we talked more specifically about the LEAB. It didn't indicate any desire for that. Maybe there's been a philosophical change in the organization since then. Well, there is new leadership, hopefully, right. so that might be a Could be. conversation to have. Remember, it's going back to the Senate in some century. Mm -hmm. I know. Likewise, I say that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else from committee members on this topic? Not the entire organization. Okay. Committee, I'm not hearing anybody. Well, our drafter has left the room. But I'm, she's, these folks had to head over to appropriations for the Pay Act presentation over there. Um, as I understand it, we're leaving things as is unless somebody speaks up from the committee otherwise. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll have to fight another day. Okay. 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 Uh, John, what was that? No, no, no. Oh, okay. That's not the reason we saw it. Oh, okay. Mr. Gendenis? All right. So <laughs> we're next, you were doing a whatever. <laughs> so we're next no, taking up. This bill and its appendages tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock for two hours, another joyful two hours. What could we possibly have left that's going to take two hours? We haven't even yeah. touched the dispatch uh, section. I mean, How long have we been waiting this then? <laughs> you know, how many times can we dial back and move forward? Two steps forward, one step back. Bye, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. <laughs> 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 I know. I know. Rob is. Just he's not only pretty, just an old guy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to turn this page. <laughs> and I have S281. All right. S28. And now somebody's car alarm's going. Oh, that happened one day. It went on and on. They shut it off. I wonder. I wonder if someone from law enforcement could go take care of that. Yeah. Maybe they could. Out. They could. Maybe they could Just meet shoot. and come to consensus. Well, they have to have yes. a council meeting. So I would. <laughs> Darn. Systemic Brother. racism. Mitigation thereof. All right. Now, John. Uh, oh, our our IT person left us. I I, I don't want to be looking at that sexual exploitation know. business too much longer. It, well, it'll go black on its own. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, Patty, you have a copy of this, right? Yes. And is it posted at this yes. point? On our web page? Should be. Oh, look at that, that water coming in. Folks? Water? Uh, uh, the, the screensaver there. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, we go to our web page. Senator Bryn? Uh, this is today. We're doing today's. Oh, oh Dad, now that I can't, I can't even do my own cast. Yep, anymore. Sir. You got it. Is that a breath? Is that yeah. the draft? Draft 1.1. One. Uh, okay. No. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me, let me catch up with you folks. I was. Who did our OT person go? He's over in appropriations. Oh. Uh, uh, Jessica. Ask that he go over with her, and this this being her first time. Okay, are we um, looking at a particular section here? No, no uh, just start. Well, why don't we start from the top? So no, I mean, but well, well, just one mm -hmm. one moment, please. For the for the good of the order. Oh, and this is being recorded also. It's important that people. I know we understand this in this room, but people from out there, who have been sending us all kinds of messages about this bill. We need to help them understand that this bill has, it does not have a nexus 
with any change in the Vermont Constitution and the prohibition on slavery that we've been, yeah. we have been getting mm -hmm. messages mm -hmm. saying pass S-281 so as yeah. to prohibit slavery in the state. We were one of the first states to. <laughs> well, in, 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 the, uh, in Article One of our Constitution, it does prohibit slavery once you've attained the age of 21. Yeah. It's yeah. inferred that until you hit 21, you can, slavery is okay. Mm -hmm. It is inferred. But this bill is not the way to deal with that. Okay, and out there, for some reason, People have gotten it all mixed up. I gather from one piece of information, I saw that the Senate is, has somewhere over there uh, um, the appropriate legislative approach to starting the amendment to the Constitution process. That's over there. But it's no, not can. part of 281, okay? Isn't that next year that the Senate can start constitutional amendments? I'm not even going there. It's not part of 281. That's our responsibility, That's right. 281. Okay? So if we could, everybody's got, oh, and it's up there on the screen. All right, so John, could, could you talk to us about so, this work that you've been This is my there? amendment um, to S-281. Um, I've been working on it for a couple weeks, um, talking with some of the... Uh, the stakeholders with respect to 281, um, you know, within our own house, uh, Representative Gonzalez, Christy, and Morris, um, with respect to the administration, Beth Fastigi, um, and uh, also on the Senate side with um, Senator White um, to try to get, uh, you know, some language that most everybody could live with, if not be excited about. Um, and so that's what this draft. Um, amendment that I put together proposes to do it is, you know, is take some of the language was, that was in the, the earlier version of this bill and take some of it out and move some of it around. Um, so the key, so just to summarize what the key changes are, um, the key change with respect to the structure um, is that um, the, the panel, um, right now it's called a racial equity panel, but that in working on the amendment, I was not focused on the name. Um, that can, you know, change. Um, there is a lot of testimony about what the name should be, um, and I don't really have a, a big position on what the name should be. Um, so, with respect to that, so the structure would be there, there would be a panel. Um, it would be the same panel appointed by the same individuals as in the original bill, which is, um, you know, appointment by a, a number of people, including the chief justice. Um, the Governor, uh, Human Rights Commission, and I think the House and Senate. Um, so that would be the makeup. Um, they would recommend three names to the Governor um, for the, the Chief Officer, um, and then uh, uh, the Governor could choose from those three names to appoint somebody um, as Chief Officer. The Chief Officer would be in the administration. They would not be independent. They would not be part of the cabinet. There's some language in the original bill that was, I think, a little confusing about whether they're cabinet level or not cabinet level. So that language has been um, made, you know, eliminated or, or, or downplayed. And so they would report to the governor. Um, and they would collaborate um, with the various state agencies, with the Human Rights Commission, um, you know, to develop uh, policies and practices um, uh, to help eliminate systemic racism in state government. Um, Do you have a, is that? Yeah, this is the draft that's up there. I, I'm just. That's this one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going through an over, you know, highlight of what's in the thing, in the bill. And then we can do a walkthrough. But so that, that's the, you know the significant change. Another big significant change is subpoena power is eliminated from the bill um, because it was it was there is definitely a conflict in the original version of the bill between whether this was a collaborative effort with state agencies or was an investigative unit that was going to conduct investigations. Now, if you looked at what the, the Human Rights Statute did, not only did the Human Rights Commission have subpoena power, but then it had the ability to take certain types of enforcement actions um, against 
uh, people who discriminated. So that language is all out. Um, the, the, the goal for this is that the chief officer you know, would collaborate with the governor and the state agencies um, to address systemic racism. Uh, through a number of different ways, and we can go through that in detail when we do a walk through the bill. So that would be the focus there. Um, the, the panel itself would be advisory in nature. Um, it's called the Racial Equity Advisory Panel, and it would advise the governor with respect to how to address these issues. Um, so th those are pretty significant changes with where the bill started. Um, I should also note um, that we have eliminated uh, one of the issues that the Eternal Attorney General's office had with respect to the quota, there is no longer a, re a requirement that there be three, mem three members um, uh, with, okay. of color. That's been eliminated. Um, so I think that takes care of that issue. Um, and so those are basically the, the highlights with respect to the bill. Is there an appropriation here, John? Okay, so the appropriation that there is, um, and this came from the original, there's an appropriation of $75,000. That's in section six. Uh, one section that's in the current amendment that will be eliminated based on a conversation I had yesterday with Beth Fastigi is that section, we don't need section five anymore because this will be part of the administration. Uh, that language came from the, the creation of the ethics uh, commission and, and the director of the ethics and because that was going to be a totally independent commission and an independent director um, that language was was in there um, she believes that this language is no longer needed um, so that's one thing I would propose eliminating from this draft um, but other than that um, it is you know I think everything here it is what I was proposing. The only only thing is is I did not spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the name of, of either the chief officer or the panel should be. I mean, there, we hear a lot of testimony on that, and I think we can. But you took out civil rights. We we, we took out on. civil rights because no one likes civil rights. I, I can tell you the administration doesn't like. Uh, we not want the term systemic racism. Um, in, in the title for either the panel or the officer. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, those, those two titles would probably not be good. So if, it, you know, racial equity is just something that we quickly came up with. I could also see racial justice. I mean, one of the concerns the administration has is that, um, well, the initial focus for this panel and for this officer should be on racism. At some time, um, it should focus on other isms um, such and I'll just give one example of sexism um, you know at some point there should be an expansion of responsibilities but the primary focus um, for the panel and the officer right now should be on racism um, and this was what the administration well it, it, the administration was concerned about that issue yeah. but the other stakeholders were very <coughs> focused on ensuring that we start with racism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then if we move want to move into other areas that that can be done and I could see that when this sun sets in, mm -hmm. in 2024, or if we want to make that sooner, that's something that could be considered as part of the sunsetting process. It is you know, should we expand the focus of this panel and this officer uh, to other areas? Depending on what the situation. Depending on is what, then. what the situation is, then yeah. yeah. Depending on how much you know, folk, you know, okay. success we've had dealing with racism. So first, I just want to say thank you very much mm -hmm. for trying to do your darndest with all these different players and coming forward to the committee with this. Um, so we've got a lineup for questions. We've got Marsha, Rob, Jim, that I'm aware of for, for the moment. Okay, Marcia, Rob, so Jim. mine is maybe more of a point of clarification to Jim's question about the appropriation. My understanding is that the 75,000 is really a six month Appropriation, is that correct? That is correct. That's my question. Uh, Rob. Um, and I don't know if it's addressed further in the bill here, John, but I'm, I'm curious to know the, the relationship between the executive director and, and this panel, because it looks like the panel just gets created just to put forward three names for the governor, but what, what's the intent of the relationship after that? 
Well, I think, you know, because, I mean, the officer is a single individual, um, the panel will, will be able to provide more expertise into systemic racism, um, give it a more diverse, you know, group of views with respect to the issue, and be able to advise both the chief officer, state agencies, and the governor uh, on, you know, what steps, what best practices are out there with respect to, you know, systemic racism. And just to, to give uh, more guidance to the chief officer and to the administration as to how to, how to come up with, uh, you know, ways um, to address the problem. Uh, but I think that's the role of it. It's not going to be, you know, making determinations uh, about what should or should not be done, um, but it can give some guidance. Now, how often do you envision a panel meeting? Uh, I, I think that needs to be determined between the, the administration and the, the chief officer, um, you know, should bring in the, the panel when it's appropriate. And I think, you know, given some of the um, objectives or goals of the bill with respect to what the chief officer needs to do, I think there are opportunities with respect to each of those things where, you know, the panel could give some input um, before, you know, steps are taken by the administration to start uh, addressing um, some of the, the systemic racism issues within state government. Thank you. Jim? Um, I'd like to echo the chair's uh, comments that um, you were very good to bring all the parties together to some type of middle ground that's not easy uh, on many bills, as we all too well know. Um, I think I got my question the answer. I was going to ask you, you had mentioned sunset, and I, I was looking quickly for it, and I see there is a sunset in this in 2024. Was that part of your conversations as well? Um, no, it, that was in the original draft of the bill, okay. um, but, you know, it's something. Um, I, th I think it's, um, it's great to have a sunset, if for nothing else, to revisit it mm -hmm. is a position necessary going forward uh, have we made vast improvements um, yeah I don't know what the right date is I mean I would think uh, that the, the legislature would want to not wait till 2024 to see if this was a, a, a good use of state funds or or, or not uh, and, and whether the mission should change as you alluded to um, earlier so uh, I there's a date in there, um, and I didn't realize it was the same date on the original bill, so it may be something that we want to have a conversation about. Uh, when When is this reviewed again? Other questions for now? We're going to be taking this bill up with Bryn. She'll do an a actual walkthrough okay. after, after floor, 15 minutes after floor, and we'll dig in further with questions and seeing where folks talk. Cindy? I just want to echo what Jim said. It, we just did this with the last bill where there was a kind of an update along the way. Mm -hmm. So that might be just something to toss around. And this is supposed to be a full-time job for the ED? Yes. Is it? It's a full-time job. Okay. Only funded for six months. But. With benefits? Yes. Thank you. Did you have something? Any other questions? Um, we need to put them in the Pay Act if we create this position. I mean, there's an appropriation, but that's mm -hmm. with benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and I, this is an appointed position, so it's not going to fall under um, the collective bargaining agreement falls under executive branch mm -hmm. right right so uh, do we have to create something that goes in the pay act before we're done? i didn't mean That's to a good question um occasionally but I this have goes one. into effect upon passage as stated here mm -hmm. um we have to think that through let's just think it through okay i've got no immediate response got till this afternoon to figure this out okay mm -hmm. um Perhaps John already has a thought. Well, I mean, based on the testimony we heard yesterday, I mean. Oh, I'm sorry. Finish, finish, finish. Um, not every position in state government that's not part of the collective bargaining agreement is listed mm -hmm. by title in the Pay Act. Um, it's 
typically the cabinet level positions, and one of the things we try to soften in this bill is that mm -hmm. this is not, not a cabinet one. level position. Think of one year to my heart that is not, that an opioid coordinator okay. position is not, is not listed in that. In, in a payout. I'm glad mm -hmm. you said close to my heart. The drug mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, um, and another factor here is that it is a position that already has a potential end to it with the, the sunset. It's not, it's not envisioned from the get-go as something that is ongoing. Right. Yeah, I didn't mean to throw any monkey wrenches. I was just asking the question uh, because the uh, Miss Payak the here payout. is across the hall. Well, I have a question. Is and your Mr. Payak, and here's another Mr. I'm an assistant to the Payette. assistant, so. Yeah. You're all equal on this, yes. It, we have spoken about this briefly earlier, and it's, <clears throat> it's possible that some of these positions that are already ingrained in state government, um, that we're dealing with, you know, civil rights and other mm -hmm. isms, could potentially migrate to that mm -hmm. position mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. That's possible. So mm -hmm. maybe just a reallocation of existing resources. As yeah. moving into the future. Mm -hmm. And then since the structure's already there. Mm -hmm. But that's not for us to deal with. No. Correct, right. Presently. No. Yes, Jim. Um, did you have conversations with the Attorney General's office? No, I didn't. Uh, would we hear from you? Look behind. I, I, I realize <laughs> that he is. Um, the, um, or, yes, um, but I would be very interested. Well, I was going to ask if either of these gentlemen had any immediate thoughts. If that's <laughs> um, have a seat. It's much more comfortable right yes. up there. <laughs> For the record, I'm, I'm Tom Waldman, the General Counsel of the Department of Human Resources. Um, Representative Gannon, I think, has uh, expressed most of the substance of uh, the administration's concerns in how he characterized his interactions with the commissioner. Um, we do have some thoughts about the title. We would like to see the word uh, diversity in the title, in addition to not seeing the words uh, systemic racism, and that, again, I think goes to um, the point that Representative Gannon made about the, the administration wanting to see this position, yes, deal with racism, but also uh, be broader in scope. Um, so that's one issue. Um, the other things, um, we would like to see the governor's appointee to the panel have a four-year term. Um, other than that, I think I think that we are uh, we're fine with with this. Questions for Tom? Good. No. To have a four-year term. <laughs> it's a, a, I think one or two. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the only yeah, other thing, the only oh, other oh, thing wait, that wait, I would wait. add, right? people are at the, <laughs> the only other thing that I would add is that um, the administration is working on an executive order. Um, we're working very hard on it. We think that if the executive order that that we're working on is issued by the governor, that it might completely obviate the need for this legislation. You know, it, there, there may be no need for, for this in statute if the executive order that we are working on is, is issued. Jim and Cindy. I, Tom, I appreciate that um, clarification. However, um, we still have the appropriation issue. Correct. Yeah, that, so, that would so be the somehow one. the legislature. I think that, would, that would be the one way that, has to play the one thing that we would need role. is is to have the funds appropriated and, and for, the, for the position. You are well aware when we play a role with money, we like to insert a little bit of legislative direction. So um, it's just the reality. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Cindy. Wouldn't it be the case that the next administration could just stop doing this? Well, that, that is an issue with an executive order. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Just checking. Thank you. 
Anything else? When would the administration plan to issue this order? And, I mean, we have a limited period of time yeah, in the session, and, and if we don't do this, and then we the order are, is an uh, issue yeah. or whatever. I understand the question, and uh, we're working very hard on the order. I wish I had a more specific answer for you. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. I, I, I would just want to add in from my own personal perspective that I believe, uh, understanding the different branches of government, the executive branch needs to do what it needs to do, the legislature needs to do what it needs to do. Certainly. And the point raised by Representative Weed uh, resonates pretty strongly, at least with me. If it's not in statute, it can, well, anybody, statute can be changed, granted, mm -hmm. but if it's not in statute to start with, then it's much easier for things to disappear. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. How do you spell your last name? Uh, Waldman, W-A-L-D-M-A-N. I had it almost there. Thank you very much. Everyone in Vermont wants to turn me into a Walton. <laughs> I will not do that. I will walk. That's not a bad. Julio, do, do you have yes. thoughts? You have yeah, a few, a few uh, questions for the committee, I think. Julio Thompson, right? Yeah, good morning. Julio Thompson, Assistant Attorney General, Director of the Attorney General Civil Rights Unit. Uh, I've only had a chance to look at this amendment this morning, so. Um, well, same here, so. Okay, so we're all on the same. We're all at the, the same playing field, uh, and I will come back when uh, Bryn does the walkthrough. This afternoon. This afternoon, I think after floor. Um, there are a couple of points that I would just raise for the committee to consider, um, uh, because I don't know what the answers are, and um, but there are issues that will come up, and there. In the prior version of the bill, there was a subpoena power, and I raised the issues that exist with the subpoena. The issue about access to records from other branches of government that are otherwise confidential by law still exists in this version. On page one, it says the <coughs> cabinet, this is line 17, and 16 and 17, it says the cabinet shall work collabor collaboratively and shall provide the director with access to all relevant records. Um, so the question for me is, as a lawyer, if we are in litigation or we are doing an investigation, when we do an investigation of someone, we're entitled to the relevant non-privileged materials. So there are lots of materials that may be relevant to your question but are otherwise subject to some statutory protection. So, for example, if the executive director decides he or she wants to investigate whether there are racial disparities or racial bias working through foster care decisions through the Department of Children and Families and says, we'd like the last 10 years of all your files related to uh, adoptions or placements of children of color so that we can see if there's systemic bias there, and then the commissioner of DCF replies, there are 15 state statutes that say that we can't provide any or a lot of these records, including communications with our attorneys or legal analyses, and then if what happens if the executive director says, my statute says all relevant records, so if they're relevant, I'm entitled to all of them. So I think that issue about confidentiality or privilege needs to be addressed. The second question related to that is whether the materials that are obtained from the executive director uh, from other agencies, that those materials that would otherwise be exempt from public records disclosure somehow lose their protection because they're disclosed to a different cabinet member. So you could have, I'm doing the 10-year study of DCF or say it's of agency of education, disciplinary outcomes, or investigations of faculty, and there's a public records request wanting all email exchanges or notes discussing issues of faculty and uh, concerns about all of that. Are those matters of public record or not? Those are choices 
that are that have to be made, and I don't have a, a recommendation on that because I'm not sure what sort of records the executive rec exec executive director would do, but I just know it's not addressed. Um, and uh, so there are um, because every every recipient of a public records request has to turn it over unless they can show a statute or a law that says these materials are confidential. And it's not clear to me that if something was confidential in the hands of agency education, but they turn it over outside, that somehow it loses the confidentiality. Because that could really affect, in my world, when we do civil rights investigation, uh, the likelihood of publicity really silences people. Um, so if we talk to witnesses, or where people are just acting on hunches, or if you're looking at systemic, there's, you might not have smoking gun evidence, right? So people are talking about concerns about colleagues or subordinates, um, and the first public records request releases all that in the newspaper. My guess is that the remaining years won't be that fruitful in terms of talking with state employees or contractors about their concerns about other individuals, because they may not want to be in the newspaper. So I think that's an issue that um, would have to be um, grappled with. Um, uh, Cindy has a question on that. Piece. Sure. Uh, we'd be interested. I uh, would be interested, anyways, in hearing what you would suggest. Uh, couldn't we put in, as far as all relevant records, couldn't we put all relevant non-privileged records? Or is that, I don't know if that's the right terminology? Uh, something like that. I mean, something okay. that I'd say all records, all relevant records, not otherwise, you know, deemed confidential by law. Something to that effect, right. which Some counsel. Some statutory could, reference or something. Mm -hmm. aren't, aren't, yes, I mean, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, aren't um, names and emails and personal information already exempt if you, you were referring to the public records request? So, I mean, no. if we just... Reminded? No. Not you, necessarily. People can ask for private information from. A, well, it depends what it is. For example, you could be. I could go to. I myself could go to Department of Education and ask them to produce all emails with the name Julio Thompson in it, and they'd have to be able to show, unless they were investigating me, or unless there were some matters that were subject to the attorney-client privilege that did not involve me personally, they would have to be, but just the notion of like emails, they wouldn't say, well, we're gonna redact every email. You could do that. I mean, it's a pretty broad um, statute. It's, it's interpreted very generously uh, in favor of disclosure by the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just think um, that's not an area of expertise I have about public records law, except to the extent that we routinely get requests from people who want to know who we're investigating or what happened and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, in areas like sexual harassment, it's people are very worried about losing their jobs, etc. So I, I'm just saying that that's the issue about public records would need to be addressed somehow. And I don't, off the top of my head, I'm, I, I haven't come up with a good idea. I think we're looking for, for data, but not necessarily who the data is attached to. Well, it doesn't say that. It says all relevant records. It doesn't say de-identified data. We just need to. Well, right, we can tweak that. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Okay. And then yes. Rob has a question. Sure. I'm not sure how to quite phrase this, Leo. Is it is there? <clears throat> um, like in the federal government, you have security clearances. Yeah. That entitle you to see different. Yes. Type of information is there. Some sort of a designation that you could give a, a person in this position that would allow them to look at um, that type of information. Does that make sense? We don't have security level right. I, different right. levels. I mean, for example, we, we have that notion does operate to some extent, although I don't think it applies to this particular office. For example, our civil rights unit, we're investigating a claim of sexual harassment, and then once we start doing our investigation, one of or more of the incidents of harassment, uh, if they occurred, would constitute sexual assault. So we want to be able to contact the police about that, maybe have talked to a detective, initiate a criminal investigation. Our, our confidentiality statute says 
information we receive in those investigations are confidential except to law enforcement. So sometimes we get information and we can share it to the Human Rights Commission because they enforce the law or the Department of Labor or in some cases the FBI, U.S. Attorney's Office. So it's not like a security level, but they identify um, you know, who we, a, a category of individuals. Like we couldn't give it to, we couldn't give it to you um, unless we had a court order or the consent of the parties. And, but if one of you were working in law enforcement, we, we could if, if that were uh, necessary to, to continue the investigation. Um, would you envision this position needing that um, ability to do that? I don't know. I don't, I'm not really sure I have a full understanding. I mean, the way that I, I, I tend to look at these sorts of things where panels and committees are to imagine someone showing me up on Monday morning and they've got 2,000 hours worth of work to put in in the next year. What do they do day to day? Um, and uh, in evaluating the legislation, if that person's view about what records they need to do their job and what's necessary is at odds with the a commissioner's view, um, then, then who, who wins that? And um, so, or if there's an issue, I mean, if there's issues about confidentiality, what's likely to happen is someone's going to knock on the attorney general's office and say, does all relevant records mean mm -hmm. privileged or non-privileged? Because in the rest of our world, um, the obligation is to produce responsive, non-privileged materials and to be able to identify a public records um, exemption if there's going to be an exemption. Um, it's also possible just looking down the road, and this is what I want to review this in light of, it's possible that um, the request even for de-identified data that the executive director asked for could be really burdensome. So it could be I want the last 10 years of 10,000 files and I want you to redact all of the people's names in it. And then people come to us and say, do we have to respond to that? That's going to cost us $20,000 in a manpower, but the executive director on the other side of the table says, it says all relevant records. And it also says you're supposed to work collaboratively. So I don't, you know, I'm not really, I mean, it's conceivable that, um, that people will just agree to disagree about how intrusive or how burdensome the records could be, and it may all work out, but part of my evaluation of legislation is, well, what if it doesn't? Mm -hmm. Who wins that fight between the agency of education and the equity officer? If, um, and it might be that the governor, because they're in the cabinet setting, that they'll work it out and say, hey, come to some reasonable compromise. That could happen, um, but it might not. And the question then for us would be, who do you, how, if, if you're going to put in a mechanism or, um, I don't know what this executive order, if it's going to work in tandem with this or not, would resolve that, but I'm in the dispute business, and that's an area of dispute I could see where people acting in good faith can just have different views about what's relevant and what's too burdensome and what's not too burdensome. It happens around here all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, if, if your scenario came to fruition here, who, who would you be representing? Well, that's the other issue that I'm getting to, right? Uh, I'm about to get to, which is that if things were not be able to resolve, I mean, I don't know if there's a conflict between one state state agency or not. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how that would resolve now. I, I, it, it is possible that right now that there can be conflicts between agencies. Let's say the Department of Public Safety and Fish and Wildlife about their activities. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, but those those are those things just tend to be worked out administratively without lawyers here. There's no statutory right for Department of Public Safety to get all relevant records of fish and wildlife, or vice versa. That's like a that's a right. And if there's a right, then someone uh, they want that they want a lawyer to enforce that right if necessary. And the other side may have a disagreement about how far the right goes, and they would want legal representation. So I'm not sure. The Human Rights Commission, they have a lawyer. The executive director is a lawyer. Um, and she proceeds in court uh, when she has matters against the state of Vermont. The state of Vermont 
uh, lawyers in a different division or office would represent agency of education or corrections or transportation and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure what the mechanism is here um, and whether, I mean, it would, I mean, one possibility is that sometimes when there's a conflict, that, they, that can happen between an agency and an individual, a corrections officer and the department gets sued and the officer wants his or her own defense because maybe their account of what was they were trained to do differs from what the department says. So there may be a conflict and then what happens is that um, the officer demands and receives outside counsel um, who is a lawyer from a law firm. Um, so, you know, and that comes out of the, the the funding for Department of Corrections, I imagine. Um, so, I mean, that's a possibility. There is a mechanism for doing that. Um, it's going to it cost money um, to hire those folks. We don't have people who are just kind of on the bench and a retainer get charged by the hour typically. But so that's because that those conflicts are possible. It's just to the extent you can resolve or work with the administration to. Res identify how those conflicts would be resolved would probably make it less expensive less and, and, and incur less delay. I mean, you wouldn't want this executive director to be spending three months fighting over what records to get from a given agency that, you know, that might be all, that could be all consuming. Um, and since there's only one person or they have some support from the agency administration, that might not be a very productive use of time. So I, I'm, not I'm not sure I have an idea about what you want because I'm not really sure, again, what the person does. There is the other issue here, and maybe it's not such a big issue. It won't be an, an issue in practice, but a lot of the, uh, the prior version of the bill included hiring a consultant who could do kind of a quantitative, qualitative, you know, a social science analysis. And that's not provided here. And the question is, are some of those duties, would those fall upon the executive director? And if so, do, do you want to state that that would be a qualification for the, because right now it says the governor chooses among three qualified candidates. The panel decides what counts as qualified. Um, and if they're supposed to be gathering all these records, and now what do you do with those records, and how do you make judgments and identify that, that requires a skill set, and it's not clear to me if the panel comes up with three people who have no experience in that or who, who don't even believe in quantitative analysis. Does the governor have the ability to say, send me another three names? I'm not sure that's quite permitted in the, in the current draft. So, um, so I think because quantitative analysis, yeah, because quantitative analysis or that kind of social science research mm -hmm. is not funded for on the outside and probably is going to be is going to fill up those two thousand hours, you may want to have that as part of the duty is that that person is is capable of undertaking that analysis because um, I there are lots of people who apply for for internships or jobs in our office who say they're qualified and their view about qualified doesn't. I mean, some of them don't have law degrees and they're applying for assistant attorney general, for example. So, I mean, um, you know, I mean, I'm just saying that views can differ um, even among well-meaning people. So that, that's something that I, that I think you would want um, to look at. And last issue, and this may be a mood issue now, about <clears throat> the, the, the references to systemic racism. Um, so in my world and in Karen Richards' world, we, we live in the world of racial discrimination. So what you are tackling are biased actions. Um, training typically addresses both people's actions and their beliefs. Um, but because we have government employees, um, the government can't tell people how to think. They can tell them how to do their jobs and communicate. Um, and so, uh, so we're, we're, we're interested in seeing what changes will be made to the, I understand when people say systemic racism, what they're really talking about is discrimination. But I can see and envision at some point if there were changes being made, someone says I, the government is moving me out of a position because of my First Amendment views. 
um, my, I have certain views about, let's say, affirmative action, which is not an and. Some people say that may be racist or not. And some people may say it's just poor social policy. Um, but if there are employees who, um, not in the discharge of their jobs, are just identified or viewed by this panel or by the executive director as being part of systemic racism, that could conclude that, and something happens to those individuals, they're moved out of positions on the basis of views about affirmative action, which is a political belief, then that presents a First Amendment problem. There are sometimes, uh, always when we're dealing with government employees, uh, we're, dealing with, we're dealing sometimes with competing constitutional values, the equality pr principle from the 14th and 5th Amendments and the First Amendment, which says people are, um, you know, government employees still have some freedom to have their own viewpoints as long as it doesn't affect or interfere with the job. So that's something that uh, I wouldn't say it's a red flag, but it might be a yellow flag for folks to keep aware of um, because, um, you know, if you look, well, we, I, I think of the affirmative action, because I mentioned before, our, our office filed briefs on the last affirmative action case, the Fisher case, a couple of years ago. It's a five to four decision. The well meaning people there who have very different views about what the Constitution means or what good social policy means. Um, and um, in that case, the majority of justices, I, you one could imagine if they were in state or federal government and someone's in the business of rooting out systemic racism, they would say these four Supreme Court justices are, have views. Because um, it's, it, when it's taking government action on the basis of someone's viewpoint as opposed to their conduct, that's kind of First Amendment territory. Some people loosely say that's kind of thought police. Um, and I'm not saying that racism is not an ill. It is. But there are limits to what the government can do, uh, even with its own employees. Um, and so um, we always have to be, just, we just have to be careful and, and have an understanding of when you're talking about targets and performance measures, what that actually means. We're really talking about behaviors rather than underlying be beliefs because I'm sure all of you, for example, have your own views about attorneys, let's say, but your, your conduct so far has been it's great. Changed. <laughs> 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 um, so, so that's just, um, that's just something that um, we sometimes run into because we do investigations of, say, city employees um, and, they, and people use social media Right, so people's viewpoints might be known outside the workplace, and if bad things start happening to those people where they're speaking as citizens about matters of public interest, then there are First Amendment issues that come in. So it's the, it's the whole Bill of Rights that applies, not just the 14th Amendment. So, so those, are, those are the areas, I think. Mm -hmm. that we Questions to follow up with Hikuli? Well, no. No, I no? Mean, Point out, Jim. No, I very much appreciate your your comments, and if you read through it further, I, I for one would be very interested in any suggestions you might have mm -hmm. to make this work. I'm not sure, quite frankly, uh, that we want to get too prescriptive on the qualifications for the executive director. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, I think there's a board that's going to. Mm. You know, that's going to prevent names, and I think that's part of their process of uh, trying to figure out, you know, what it is they want to see in a director. And I would think when they interview new candidates, um, they're going to have to have done some of that beforehand. Um, that's just me. John and then Rob. Uh, I, I just wanted to. I did remove the consultant from the, the bill, and the reason I did that, it was my own decision, was because it was not a funded position. Um, I, I just feel terrible about putting things in bills that are unfunded, and so it's like the Clean Water Act, you know, the fact that we pass that without figuring out how to fund it. Well, and as part of the administration, there's no reason why the administration can't allocate, reallocate resources, right. whether it's staff or otherwise, to, to do some of that. Uh, but that was that was the reason I did that. I, I mean, I do understand that that some of this is is data 
analysis, and, and that might be a qualification um, for for the chief officer here. But, and I'm not having, I don't, our office doesn't have a view about whether you should have a consultant or not. And it is true that other agencies have in-house people who do quantitative analysis. But what, you, what one loses, I mean, at least potentially loses, is if that individual doesn't have that skill set that one, their own review, their independent review might be weaker than if somebody had the experience or they might rely more heavily upon people who might already have kind of an, an institutional bias toward what they already do, right? That, that they might, so an agency, just the way bureaucracies work anywhere, is that individuals might do the quantitative analysis and see the data or present the data in a way which defends, let's say, the status quo, where someone who's not part of that agency might and who's, and who's savvy with data analysis might say, yeah, but you're not accounting or you're not controlling for this factor or that factor. And a consultant generally would, would be in a position to do that, um, but without a consultant, then they, you, it would basically be the executive director or the panel, and at least right now, there's no indication that any of them would have, you know, would have the, the, those qualifications. So um, I, I just raise that as a potential mm -hmm. issue to... To, to chew on, that's all. And we could have Rob's question, and then we, any other questions on this till after floor, Julio's gonna be back. We, before, in, by quarter of, we need to deal with the Montpelier Charter Amendment, and then have the uh, stuff from Ag coming up also. I, I, I can defer my question, because it's, it's kind of a jump ball question anyway. And it's I'm a not, what? <clears throat> a jump it's ball a question that, ooh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> 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 <I'm> here. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll wait until later. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Because you're going to be back this afternoon I mean, after I think floor anyway. One o'clock yeah. or one issue? Well, we go on the floor at one. Oh, so on the floor after. On the after. Floor. Okay. Well, sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much. Okay. Thank Give us stuff that we can work with. Thank you. Okay, folks, so be jotting down your subsequent questions. We'll have Bryn with us after floor. And we can continue working off the uh, proposed amendment. And thank you again for John. John, I noticed that you were taking all your notes. So, um, okay. Uh, and uh, John, still speaking to John, you have the proposed amendment for Montpelier's yeah, charter. Yeah, I think we sent it to our own. Mm -hmm. it's, we have it on our mm -hmm. web page. It's yeah. really complicated. <laughs> By email, it is. Yeah. We've had a tendency to make. Yeah, after I've written my core speech and everything. Yeah. Now you change it? Yeah. Ooh, whose idea was it? Was that a call? What's, yeah. It was the committee's idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, he said in committee he was fine the way it was written. I don't remember he was discussing this. We talked about it in committee? Yes. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. You were taking a minute. Well, I, I too have not I'm not seeing. It's in an email? It's in an email? Email, email, email. Maybe oh, it's in an email. Oh, it's in an email. So it's not in here. No. So it's not on our website. Okay. John Gannon. Yeah, it's for me. Mm -hmm. That's what I asked. We're going to email from Tucker. What's the date? There's uh, today. Yes, that is today. 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 Okay, and so we can open it up. And is that a button push <coughs> for recording? Please. It is. Oh, good. Well, have you been recording all this while? Yeah. No. Thank goodness. All right, there it is. Okay, so, so we've got a new draft that we're about to go through with Bryn. So may, oh, wait a minute, not right off, Bryn. Oh, thank you for raising your hand. Thank, well, thank you for delaying the vote. Yeah, I, no, I wanted to have a conversation with our assistant attorney general, and I missed um, that opportunity. The, the amendment to the Montpelier <laughs> Charter? Remember, we held the vote till after. Oh, Lord. God, how could I forget? All right. It was traumatic. I bet it was. <laughs> it would have been traumatic for me had I missed the vote. So, so, I so we all you. know what we're voting on. Mm -hmm. The amendment proposed by our colleague from Wilmington so that Montpelier doesn't lose a day. All right. we wouldn't want In that. between but shifts. Only theoretically, lose a day. Yes. Not. Uh, we'll hold it open for Patty, but we can get the rest okay. of this done. I hope right. that. Okay, we're, we're going to call the roll. Right. Yes. 
Devereaux. Yes. Gannon. Yes. Gardner. Yes. Harrison. Yes. Kitzmiller. Yes. Leclerc. Yes. Don't yes. um, Reed. Yes. Townsend. Yes. Which one are we doing? Montpelier Amendment. We're, we're voting on. John's Montpelier okay. Amendment. Lewis. Yes. Maybe. <laughs> Okay. Okay. No, I'm John could report. So, <laughs> so the um, the count is ten zero one. And Patty, you are you yeah. reporting the underlying bill. Are you also going to report the amendment? What did you folks work out? We didn't talk. We did. I thought you were going to. Yeah, I'm fine with that. All right. So Patty <laughs> is reporting both the amendment and the underlying bill. Okay. So, do we have a clean copy of the amendment? Uh, it's no. his yep. niece. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. no, this one still says Gannon. Because we were going to do it, weren't we going to do it as a committee? Sure. <laughs> you're you're going to report it, you are. Yeah. Yes. So, we mm -hmm. need to type this Tucker. Out. Tucker. Tucker. <laughs> okay. So, would you please send a note down to Tucker asking him. It's still on the. No. Mm -hmm. We were going to have it redirected so it was a community. Well, so we're sending a note down to Tucker. <coughs> okay. Ask if you would please ask him to change it to a committee bill and to send a copy to Denise and to Patty. Okay. How's that? Yep. Does that sound good, Patty? That's fine. And then you can take that down to the clerk's office so they'll get that in the in the uh, what's it? calendar. Calendar, thank you. <coughs> Reporting <coughs> amendment and underlying <coughs> bill. <coughs> so we can make a note on the amendment. Yeah, we can say, uh, um, I didn't see anything changed on the order in it. Where's my pillar? Okay, amendment. Yeah, I just asked her that. <coughs> Nine, zero, 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 <laughs> Yesterday. Um, Bryn, I think now we're ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Oh, one more office three one point two. Indeed. Please. Please. So, good afternoon, committee. For the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council, here to walk you through draft 1.2, which is um, a draft I put together based on a conversation with Representative Gannon. Which followed up on a conversation we as the committee had this morning. Okay. And I explained to them our discussions and okay. all that this morning. So, <clears throat> no changes to section one, the legislative intent section. I've, um, so, what I did is I highlighted everything that I changed between this draft and the, um, as passed by the Senate version. And the way I do it, um, I'm not sure if your other alleged counsel do this, but um, I do strike through of language that was in the former version, but is not in this one. So you'll see some areas that are underlined and strike through, struck through. That just means you're taking it out, even if it was in the original version. Okay, great. Just so we're clear. <clears throat> so section two, this is the powers and duties of the governor's cabinet. So um, the only change here oh dear, I'm have to with this, is that uh, we've changed the name of the position from chief officer, chief civil rights officer, to executive director of racial equity. So you'll see that throughout. So section three, this is the position. This creates the new position of the executive director. And you'll see throughout, we're, we've struck any um, reference to the position as being an in, a position that's independent of the administration. So now it's just a position that's within the administration. And it directs that position to um, work collaboratively with and act as a liaison between 
the Governor's Workforce Equity and Diversity Council, the Human Rights Commission, and the Governor's Cabinet, and takes out that language about operating independently of the Cabinet. And similarly, Section C is struck because it removes all language about the director being an independent position. So the next section is the, this creates the advisory panel, and we've just changed the title to Racial Equity Advisory Panel. <clears throat> and, you've, and you can see that we've struck out some language that requires the panel to consult with the workforce, the governor's workforce on equity and diversity, and the Human Rights Commission, because now it's the director who's charged with working with those entities rather than the panel. Okay, we're good? I'm just gonna cruise along? Okay, um, so sub B, I'm on page three now. Um, this just changes, if you remember, this was originally, it's originally said that uh, the members should not be a existing senator or representative. We just changed that to legislator. No sneaky, no sneaky moves allowed. Um, and then sub two, this was the language that would have required um, at least three members to be people of color, and we've changed that language to instead members shall be drawn from diverse backgrounds to represent the interests of communities of color throughout the state. And that's language that's drawn from Act 54. Okay. So the next change you can find in... Oh, I'm sorry. Jen has a question. John was trying to help me, but it wasn't working. Um, I go back? Going back to that, um, shall be drawn from diverse backgrounds. Um, does that result the concern that was raised about the potentially um, three members of color um, issue. It does, does that, does that it does enough indeed. language and get perhaps at the same place? It does indeed. It doesn't even require okay. racial diversity. Um, so I would say it addresses it thoroughly. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so the next section, this is the section about um, the, how the members elect the chair. And so we've just added some language here that provides that um, the appointments to the panel have to occur by September. Um, and then the duties of the panel, I'm sorry, and then the terms officially begin in, in January. So that gives them time to establish the panel and elect the chair. Okay, so the next section, subsection is subsection C. This is the duties and responsibilities of the panel. This, um, subsection has changed a lot. So it's no longer the duty of the panel to appoint the director, so we've taken that out. Um, they're also not going to conduct any oversight of the director. And in addition to advising the director, um, they are also tasked with advising the governor on strategies for remediating systemic racism. <coughs> and then we get rid of subdivision four there. That removes the report requirement. Um, so now the panel doesn't report to the General Assembly, but instead you'll see that the director is tasked with an annual report. And then sub D is out. That's the provision that um, the panel, only the panel can remove the director. So that's gone. Um, Brent, mm -hmm. so does, oh wait, no, I'm thinking of a piece that's ahead. I wait to meet that further ahead, the piece that which will come. tie back to yes. this uh, dismissal business. Okay, yes. Possibly. Okay, great. Who? who? Warren? This says each member of the panel shall be entitled to per diem pursuant to 32 VSA 1010. That's the, that, is that the one for yes, citizens out there? Yes, or is that's that, the $50 a day. Uh, so that's, legislators aren't going to get their normal per diem? No <laughs> legislators on the panel. That's right. Ah, <laughs> forgot that small piece. No legislators on the right. panel. Right, right. The ones that are appointed specifically says who right. shall not legislators be. Legislators appoint. Shall not, yeah. shall not be. Legislator yeah. appoint, appointed. Yes. They're not members of the legislature. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Sure. So now we get into the duties. Of, are we good to keep going? So. Now we get into the duties of the executive director. So the first change here is that we just removed that language that would authorize the organizational review to be conducted by an outside vendor. And 
And then... It doesn't prohibit that. No, it does not. Okay. It does just it doesn't explicitly to re refer to it, authorize it. Um, so subdivision two here, this changes the requirement from um, overseeing the statewide collection of race-based data to creating a strategy for implementing a centralized platform for the aggregation, um, correlation, and public dissemination of such data. And then three, subdivision three there is a new subdivision, and it tasks the director with developing a model fairness and diversity policy and make recommendations regarding the existing policies that are held by state agencies and departments. Okay, and then it adds some language to that um, duty under subdivision B there that um, the director is tasked with working collaboratively with this um, with the with state government and also tasked with developing best practices for remediating systemic racism throughout state government. So we'll <coughs> move on to um, subdivision D. This is the part about um, working with human resources to develop trainings, and it just adds some language there to specify that those trainings should be on the nature and scope of systemic racism and the institutionalized nature of race-based bias. And then subdivision E. So this um, is the annual reporting requirement. This is a new requirement. So it requires the director to report annually um, beginning in 2020 um, to demonstrate the state's progress towards um, remediating systemic bias. Okay, sub E, this is the, this was the authority, the subpoena power authority. We've taken that out. No more subpoena power. Okay, and this is a 5004 is a new section. <clears throat> and this is the section that directs the panel to advance three names to the governor for the governor to select to appoint the director. So A provides that um, the panel shall consider applications for the position and as many candidates as it deems qualified. Sub B provides that the, the panel has to submit um, three names to the governor of the people it deems most qualified for the role. And then C, that the governor makes the appointment um, from that list of candidates <coughs> put forward by the panel. And it provides that the names of the candidates, both submitted to the governor and not submitted to the governor, shall remain confidential. And then the next section um, in the version that's passed by the Senate was um, the section that funded the position with the surcharge on the Human Resources Fund. So you'll see that um, funding section is has been eliminated from this amendment. And instead, um, we authorize the position in Section 4, create an appropriation, unchanged appropriation in Section 5, but don't do any more directives about funding. Not and that only covers half the year, is that right? This does, yep. <clears throat> um, and then a few changes to Section 6. This is the sort of timeline of the rollout of all of this. Uh, the first change is in Subdivision C. This provides that the panel has to submit the names to the governor by January 1. And... Um, the governor has to appoint the director on February 1. And then the, dire the, the director has to report back to the General Assembly on May 1st. And so we give them an additional month there. Jim. Um, oftentimes, gubernatorial appointments need to also be approved by the Senate. Would that apply in this case? Um, it's not required that they be approved by the Senate. Um, sometimes they are. It's not how I drafted it. And, and that's fine. I just didn't know. Um, and I'm not, I mean, it's already going through a panel. It's going through names. I'm not suggesting we add it. I'm just asking. Yeah. 
you do it is sometimes appointments have or require Senate approval. Yeah, I, I, to me that just it will in this case it will draw the process longer. So okay. And that's it. Those are that's the extent of the changes to the Senate past version. Jessica? Um, first, I just want to say thank you because I've been in and out because of going to see my mom. And I, um, this is so much better. And so, I mean, it, I'm impressed. I know everybody worked on it, so I think it's great. I, um, one question I have is we had talked a bit about the Human Rights Commission and making sure that these two groups work together. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see it that we actually put that anywhere. But did we? We did. Okay. Yes. Maybe I just no. went through it too quick to see. Page it, two, page line two. eleven. I think it's in the um, <coughs> the section that creates the position. Yeah, we'll go. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay. Okay. Oh, Great. Perfect. Thanks. Object. Now we're gonna uh, perhaps talk, uh, listen to the AG's office. Uh, but um, I'll just throw it out there in terms of our own committee discussion um, of whether or not we might want to think about the sunset date, um, um, especially if we're thinking at this point that that position and commission and, uh, may evolve in terms of their primary responsibilities, uh, that maybe we put it out there for, uh, I'll throw out, 2022, um, and that would give two full terms uh, for our governor or potentially next governor, and then maybe um, uh, give the legislature an opportunity to say, okay, it, this is working great, um, or let's tweak it, or let's change the purpose, or whatever. Right? So which year did you suggest? So, 20, so down the bottom, it's mm -hmm. 2024, and my impression that um, was that that's the way it came over from the Senate. Um, so I would just throw out there maybe changing that by two years. I mean, this is three full <coughs> terms of governor. I'm thinking two might be uh, more appropriate. And give us enough of a little window to see if we're making some progress. <coughs> so. And so is that, when we do it on something like this, would that be like an author? Like, when I used to work in the, I don't know, Washington, we had to reauthorize program if we want, yeah. and so that's kind of so. Happened. Last session, when we had to reauthorize the Search and Rescue Council, it was because that had sunsetted last year. So we went through a process of, re and that's what we'd have to do here if we put, put in the sunset, which we are. So, okay. Yeah. We could do it. Yeah, you can reassess it. You can just say, okay, another four years, or you okay. can say, oh, we want to change right. its mission a little because we want to go beyond racism. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could do one year, but that wouldn't be fair. I would, I think it's a good idea, but I would argue for a little bit longer than 2024. I just think systemic racism is so deeply embedded and so pernicious. It, it's going to be slow progress. I don't think we're going to make, you know, we're not going to change everybody's hearts and minds in a brief period of time. Uh, it's going to take a while. So I, th I agree with the sunset and let's look at it, but let's give them enough time to get more accomplished. So four years is a short period of time. It's my thought. So you're suggesting going longer than 2024. 20, is that what I heard you no, say? No, no. Uh, but Jim was suggesting 2022. 20, 20, right. I, I, I think yeah, stick with the 2024. Oh, okay. Which is so uh, just a, a, a little bit more time. Rob? Well, I, I, as much as I respect and appreciate the member from Montpelier, I, yeah. the, the 2022 for me, partly because what I've heard is that we've made a lot of progress in so many different areas already. Um, and in some cases, this is just looking to take best practices of existing state agencies. So um, I, I have a hard time believing that it's as systemic and prevalent as some may think that it is. And I, I do think that the 2022 is a bit more appropriate and it gives us a chance to make sure that it's doing what we want it to do. And 
you know, if it does need to get tweaked, as some would say, then, then you can do it. But that's where I would come down on that, I think. Cindy? I think we're all putting in our two cents. I, I think we should keep it the way it is. I, this has been going on for 100 years or something, so I think it's going to take time to get the information, get the data, decide how to implement um, <coughs> programs, to operate programs, to find, you know, get results. I, I just think that's a, a process. Jessica? I, um, I kind of agree with um, the representative from the fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, for very different reasons. I think that, um, for a different reason, I think that it is systemic. It's going to take a long time. But this is brand new and we're just setting it up. And what I like about Sunsets is it gives us the opportunity to reauthorize and tweak a little where it may not be quite right. Um, I mean, this is a brand new thing. We're trying to work this out in committee. It's gone from one committee to another committee. I just think just like everything, it needs a little time to settle, and then we could come back to it by having an earlier date and would make it better. And then we could do, if we needed to, another four years. But, and I think we will need to, but we would have that opportunity. I mean, for example, we've only got $75,000 in there. Who knows? I mean, we've got to at least fix that. I guess we can do that in appropriations, but, um, but there may be other things by then in, in 2022, right? Yeah. So anyhow, I, I think for different reasons we should put a shorter date. Just, just to be clear, whatever the date is doesn't mean the tweaking has to come along with the date. Right. It can be just straight reauthorizing or pulling of plug. There doesn't have to be, you know. Yeah, you don't have to have it. It's just it doesn't that have forces to forces the question. Kind yeah, of it, but yes, it forces looking at one way or the other. That's the tweet. important piece. Yeah. yeah. They may bring us tweaks as soon as they can. Folks, can, since we've seemed to have zeroed in here on the, uh, the date for the sunset. So, yeah, sunset, not sunset. Um, do we want to try and come to some sort of agreement as to whether it's 2022 or 2024? Or split the difference. Jim? Not, not to complicate things, but would it be helpful, at least it would for me anyhow, be helpful to hear from the AG's office so that we can see if there's any other issues uh, that we might want to look at. So you want to deal with all the changes at the same time? Or one, we'll get a full list of changes and then go one more, you know, seriatim? No, we're very good at multitasking. <laughs> you are. <laughs> um, committee, shall we get all the changes sure. that people want us to look at and then we'll work through them one by one by one? That's what you want to do? Okay, uh, we're in thank you. Oh, I get to ask a question. Oh. To be please. The question that I held off asking before when you when we were at that section where the line was crossed out about the panel being able to um, send the E D on his or her way. Yes. So it is it inferred or is it implicit, whatever the proper terminology is in this version that if things aren't working out with the ED, it's the governor who speaks to this person and sends him or her on, on to other work? It is indeed. You, there is a statute, I don't have the reference in my mind, that provides that any governor appointment serves at the pleasure of the governor. Okay. So Thank I can you. get that site to the committee if you'd like. Thanks for that clarification. All right. So, Jim, you want to hear from the, uh, from Julio first? I, I would, yes. Yes, Julio, if you would take a seat to the cacophony of the various programs. <laughs> so you now see the newest draft. Any thoughts that you have, or if it's just want to be ditto on this, that, or the next thing that you mentioned this morning? We're discussing this again. Good afternoon, Julio Thompson, Assistant Attorney General, Director of the Civil Rights Unit. Um, I didn't have any additional comments on the bill. I, I think. Um, there was uh, one committee member who had a question that was going to be deferred to the afternoon, and I'm here to answer any other questions in my rise, but I don't have anything else to add. Given the new draft, 
does it change anything that you said to us this morning? Um, okay, so. There's only one change. It has to do with the pay. Pardon. The uh, taking out that. Yeah, the section five coming out. Funding part. That's the only difference between yeah. draft so, one point one and one point two. So everything that you said this morning mm -hmm. still stands. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing. Okay. So right. Rob, you were going to be asking. Well, <clears throat> and I have to say, I, I got my question answered but by a, a different means. But so thank you. I hope you so, didn't come back specifically for me. If you did, I'm sorry. But I was but, here to be available for any questions or if yeah. there were any drafts that changed the portion. I mean, the areas that I raised for the committee's consideration remain unchanged here. So I don't have anything to add to what I've said about those points. So, so on our list, Jim, we'll go back to the list from this morning. Now, if you wouldn't mind, the rest of us might profit from hearing your question and what the answer is. Perhaps. <laughs> okay. Well, my, my question was, when I phrased it as the jump ball, because I wasn't sure, is okay. um, I, I knew that there were some issues, some concerns around some of the language. And my question was, is would it be easier to address those if this was in statute or if this was an executive order? In my information is, and I was explained that it would be easier if it was an executive order to address some of these issues. That, uh, so that question, uh, with respect, is a little too vague for me to understand and to, to answer. What it, I mean, I, I raise questions about language like access mm -hmm. to all relevant records or about addressing mm -hmm. statutory confidentiality that exists. I, I think an executive order would create the same problem if it had the same language, so I'm not sure which language you're talking about, I don't, because the question would then become what records are exempt from, from access to this, this officer, either by executive order or by statute. I think the same conflict would still exist. Her question would still exist. Jim, yeah. so, you're good. All right. So if that question came up about access to records and, and confidentiality, who would advise uh, either the executive director or the administration that maybe had some concerns about providing some information. Would that be your office? Not I'd necessarily you personally, but an assistant AG uh, assigned to that branch? In, in the ordinary course, if a state agency receives a records request of any sort, whether it's a public records request or a subpoena, um, the Attorney General's office represents the state of Vermont, so we would, uh, an assistant Attorney General from our office would receive, res reserve the request, make a legal determination as to whether it's legally valid, whether it's, whether it raises issues of materials that should be withheld on the basis of privilege or other confidentiality requirements, whether it, <clears throat> even if not privileged, whether production would be unduly burdensome, so that if, um, uh, so that's, that's what we would normally do. This is a little unusual in that you would have one part of the administration has a, at least as written now, it looks like it could, could be interpreted as a plenary right to all of the records that are relevant regardless of privilege or confidentiality. And if the parties, I mean, sometimes agencies now have disputes, um, and those often just get worked out in the course of business. But if they were, I'm not aware of a situation where one agency says we have the right to this information outside of the scope of an investigation. But if, if there is a conflict about that, usually both sides have lawyers. The only example that comes to mind would be the Human Rights Commission when it's investigating mm -hmm. the state agency. They have the right, they have their own lawyer that's not in the Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. um, but so that, that mechanism would have to be worked out. Generally, we're, the Attorney General's office can't represent two parties to a dispute. The typical practice is that conflicts counsel, that's private counsel that's hired for the purpose of representing one side, um, uh, would, would be hired. That's done on an as-needed basis. Theoretically, this could be an issue that occurs more than once. Um, if, if there are, if, if this standard, um, you know, is left intact, it might be more likely because I think there are 
many agencies would probably assert that they have either state or federal confidentiality obligations oh, and, 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 and I can appreciate sure. that. I mean, for example, um, this office may want to find out about access to Medicaid uh, and who's been denied coverage or... Or educational records that yeah, identify yeah. students. And, and, right. and I can see that agency saying, well, time out, um, right. there's some confidential information here that we don't want to share. Uh, we, should, we can't share. Yeah. So if I could, right. this, I think, according to my own notes, was item number one of concern when mm -hmm. you spoke with us this morning. And I know John is next on the list, then Dennis. Um, John, were you going to raise this? Were you going to start walking through the list of concerns, or was your well, point on something else? It was on the first concern about the so access to records thing. So I had a question with respect to for Julio on that. So, I mean, has the, how many times has the AGE got involved with agency to agency requests for documents? Other than when it involves an investigation, which is a whole other matter, as far as I'm concerned. So. I don't know, but I'm also not aware of a, a statute that says that Agency A has a legal right to all relevant materials from Agency B. Okay. Uh, I'm not aware of that. It could be, but it's not something I've encountered. Yes. So mine had to do with the six concerns he had, um, equal protection and separation of powers the state's obligation to work with the panel, the subpoena power, the no provision for confidentiality, the collection and managing of data. That was the first time in the operational the first priorities. Time. That was the original bill. This is the original bill. Not it's been changed. It's right. I realize it's been changed, but I didn't know how many of the same concerns uh, oh, okay. you still had. And sure. I don't know. Uh, I know some of them have gone away. I understand that. So I think the first question about an equal protection issue regarding the selection of the panel, I think, has been mooted um, by the, uh, the separation of powers concerns because the governor makes a selection of the cabinet officer and retains the right to remove the officer. I don't think that issue is present any longer. There is no subpoena power under here, although there's a lingering question of whether the shall provide access to all records is a functional equivalent that, that a letter would be a legally enforceable demand for records. So that's that's what we were just discussing. It's not strictly speaking a subpoena, but it's if a letter saying under this statute you shall provide that, that might be enforceable in court. Uh, and was it that this morning you suggested, or perhaps I imagine this, that you suggested that perhaps adding words of um, non-privileged might cure that situation right or or some or some equivalent something that isn't deemed confidential by yes. law mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. right uh, that, that would provide a lot of it um, um, in terms of the issue about collection of data or um, I'm not really sure what it's hard to project uh, what it still could be even if you have a request for non-confidential data, just as a practical working concern, it could, disputes could still arise where they want all the documents and they say, well, then just black out the names, um, which is something that might arise in litigation or it might arise in a public records request if it's otherwise subject to disclosure. Uh, and so one could imagine there, there might be conflicts where they say, is there, you know, might say that's, there might be a dispute where they say that's going to cost this agency X thousands of dollars and X weeks or months of, of resources to respond to that. And um, so we don't want to do it. And I don't know whether in practice that's something that gets resolved within the administration. But if it doesn't, then the question, the question is, well, how would you address that dispute? And, that's, that's not addressed here at all. It's, it's not at all uncommon <clears throat> for a party that asserts a legal right to records, like in a lawsuit, to say, well, then just black out, just redact the confidential information. And then the other side might appeal to a judge and say, 
the value of what you're seeking is substantially outweighed by the cost of producing it, or that there might be alternative means to obtain the same information rather than blacking out thousands of documents. So there are mechanisms for that sort of thing. And that would be true not only in court, but say the Human Rights Commission could have that same sort of issue if they had a dispute about looking at personnel records or emails. And they so would go. They would be a mechanism to go to court if there's a dispute about that. And in this situation, also, is there not, if I understand correctly, the answer which Bryn gave to my last question to her? Say something's going on, and the governor loses patience with the executive director for what do we call him? This person, executive director for racial equity. Um, has had it with the way in which said executive director is conducting him or herself mm -hmm. in terms of the task at hand, the governor can always say, I'm happy to receive your resignation tomorrow morning. And that's the end of that dispute. Maybe. Uh, if it's a state employee, they would, I, you know, that's, I, can't, I can't say that an employment dispute, um, even for an at-will employee, would just end at that. There are lots of employees at will employees who might seek legal recourse. So I don't know. So it would someone depend appointed what, by the governor what to I'm his or her position can say, I, I okay, I, I heard what you said. So What, so what I'm saying yeah. is that if there, that there are disputes, <clears throat> if there's disagreement about the conduct, there may be disagreement about what the, whether the stated motives for termination and in employment, this is a daily issue. There are disputes about whether the stated grounds for termination are the actual grounds for termination. I see. Okay. Um, so I'm right. just <clears throat> so I don't know that the um, that that the concern about being removed would prevent the executive. I, director. I apologize for that. I even okay. asked. I okay. interrupted Dennis's mm -hmm. list. Um, <laughs> I think he's almost done. I guess the other issue, I mean, I, I don't think this bill really addresses it. It's just a matter of policy, which it doesn't really identify what areas would happen in what years, criminal justice in what. And so <clears throat> institutional or systemic racism, which aren't really courtroom words, they're more like political discourse words. Um, so that's pretty broad. It could mean quite a bit. And so my point when I initially testified on two prior versions of the bill was that if the committee or the legislature had a preference about whether there would be a phased focus, schools one year, corrections another year, or something, or you want to make sure that schools are covered some point within that X period of time, then this would be your opportunity to do that, because otherwise it's essentially left up to the executive director or the panel to focus on whatever they want. And that may be what you want to do, but typically, if you're giving someone a four-year or five-year mission to address, it would almost be like if you passed a bill, it's a poor analogy, but it's the only one I could think of on the fly saying address crime uh, over the next five years, and we're not, we don't know whether that's crimes against the person or criminal fraud or drugs, or et cetera. That's why you have a lot more specific laws. So, that, that's your call, but this would be the place to put it, because otherwise it's going to be decided by the panel or and or maybe the selection process with the governor who might discuss what those priorities are. Um, and from the AG's perspective, would it be wrong to leave it to the panel? And we don't have a position on that. It's just whether, whether you want to exercise that level of direction over a position that you want to create. <clears throat> So that one right at the bottom, that's the state's obligation to work with the panel. And that was one of your one of your concerns there, and that's still in there. On the bottom that the you're showing. shall work cleverly. Right, with the director. <clears throat> right. That's the issue I raised at the start of my remarks today, which is that there's a right to access to all relevant records. Mm -hmm. And I think there was discussion a moment or two ago about you know, unless otherwise confidential by law, that sort of thing. So it's the definition of the records as opposed to the working collaboratively that's the problem? I, 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 well, I think when you say shall provide 
access to all relevant records. Right now, that could be read to mean without regard to confidentiality. Mm -hmm. That's how I interpreted right. it, but I, it sounded as if there was a problem with the working collaboratively part also. No, but I don't think, no, I, I wasn't saying there's a concern with that language. I mean, collaboration is generally good, although in my experience, reasonable people collaborate, but they can agree to disagree, and that's usually where there's some sort of conflict resolution that occurs, and that can occur in a, a number of ways. My point, my broader point was just there isn't any way specified here, so you don't, I, I don't know that you can predict how it would happen. So does that work, or do we want to be changing it then? Does what work, then? Uh, that Senate right there. Uh, well, we're hearing it, it could work, or we should be a little bit more narrow. We need, that's where we need to put we in the not something akin to non-privileged right, in non front of those all relevant non-privileged. No, non-privileged, non-confidential. Right. Non-confidential, whatever the proper terminology is. That's where we go? Yes, I mean, after would be access to some description of the records that would include confidential, because there are probably scores of confidentiality statutes that you've enacted. And I don't think the intent, as I understand the Senate and the House, your intent is not to repeal all of those with respect to one state. I cannot imagine. Right, so that's, that's why I'm saying that. Intent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jim? Yeah, just the same one. I think it could be fixed with a couple words at the end of that sentence, uh, you know, except for those that are, I don't know, prevented by existing law uh, regarding confidentiality or... Yeah, confidential is provided by law or some equivalent of information, something. I, I, right. The right word for it, but I think that... Would... If the committee is willing to have us <coughs> fixed there, would it be possible, Julio, for you to talk with Bryn? Two lawyers talking to one another to craft that language? Mm -hmm. I, I'm always thrilled to talk to Julio, but I would just like to say, is it the committee's intent that any records subject to confidentiality requirements be withheld, or that they be redacted to um, exclude oh. confidential information? Well, committee, um. start weighing in, please. We've got two very different approaches to protecting the confidential information there. Rob? Uh, Bryn, could you elaborate just a little bit more on that as far as, I think I know what you're saying, but I just want to make sure I'm clear about sure. what you're saying. So typically when we give access to records, um, like for example, nothing in this language would subject um, the government to turn over records that are, that are subject to confidentiality requirements. So typically, if a record is subject to a confidentiality requirement, requirement, for example, it has um, personal health information, that information would have to be redacted or stripped from the document before it could be turned over. That's just federal law. So if you are asking um, for the records to be turned over, subject to confidentiality requirements, you would be asking for those documents to be redacted. But if, it sounds like what you, the language you want to go in might um, have the practical effect of withholding those documents altogether. So I think it's just important to clarify what the committee wants. If you want the committee, if you want those documents withheld, not shared, or if you want them redacted, subject to the confidentiality laws, redacted. Jessica, it seems like almost everything you could say has some confidentialityness to it, and so therefore you could end up not having to give anything unless we make it more specific. Um, I don't know. This is Thompson. I mean, I think de-identified or aggregate data, for example, provide a run from a database that doesn't identify student names. But if you were asking for files on student discipline cases, you would have federal confidentiality as well as state confidentiality laws. And so the real question is, what sort of dig do you envision this Person. Is this person going to be looking through individual discipline files, or are they looking for thousand-foot patterns and percentages? Because that may, what you envision that person looking at in order to do the job, um, may, may may inform your decision here because um, it's a shallow access, not a, you know may seek access or may obtain access as permitted by law. Um, 
but it sort of it sort of the shall gives create that's mandatory language which sets up a potential conflict where they say I don't care what you think agency of X I think it's relevant and therefore produce it notwithstanding whatever so it's just a part of it is what your vision is and I don't I don't have a full understanding of I haven't heard the testimony about that in order to offer you an opinion. Does it help at all to say something akin to pursuant to the statutory reference to the Public Records Act? I think Julio just gave us some good language there. Okay. I mean, so one change would be may is changing shell to may. May provide the director with access to all relevant records and information permitted by law. Isn't that what you said, Julio? Uh, I wasn't proposing language, but I think that sounds like what I was saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, but, I mean, I wasn't a drafting said. proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be okay with that? Um, I think that it lessens, I mean, we are, I'm not offering a view about what this officer should do. That's really mm -hmm. your vision, not something that I, that I was prepared to talk about. But the uh, I think the as provided by law covers the attorney-client privilege and statutory privileges, state and federal. Uh, and May seems to give some grounds for uh, working on an informal resolution about burden, which I think is a practical mm -hmm. difficulty. So it sounds like it would address the, the concerns that I that I identified, if that's how you wanted those to be resolved. Yeah. So just to sort of give a concept of what data we're looking for, as we shifted this from subpoena power and conducting potentially conducting investigations, we we're trying to take a collaborative approach, which is looking at high-level data about racism in state government. So, for example, we got data from the Vermont State Police, um, which just talked about traffic stops, and it just said, how many traffic stops have there been in 2015? How many have there been in 2016? How many you know, involve contraband? Just percentages, there was no individualized data. I mean, we've, you know, some of the data that's in the Act 54 report is all at a very high level. It deals with you know, you know, you know, healthcare issues, but it doesn't identify any individuals. The Human Rights Commission, their responsibility is to investigate this discrimination on an individualized basis. I don't see this body doing that because we already have a group mm -hmm. that's doing that. So it's kind of like the turnover in state government too. That would be aggregate information, right? Like we have this amount of turnover. Right, there's turnover. We have yeah. no numbers. Well, I mean, you might know we have names there's that. more turnover in this this state agency versus this, this state, state agency. agency. Yeah. And so we that would be important to look at. So you might say, hmm, maybe this agency needs a little more training than this one. Mm -hmm. Or oh, you know they've you know it's it's a different issue. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's mostly going to be aggregate data, and if we can get that down, I think that will hopefully uh, lessen um, Julio's concerns. Well, I mean, if I, if I could, Rob. Well, I just I, I guess the question is is how far do you drill down in this data to to find the answers to the questions? I mean, if you wanted to take that larger view of the turnover of people of color in state government, but realistically, don't you have to drill down and almost look at the individual, I guess, um, folks and, and see why they left? And therefore, that, that's a very different discussion, isn't it? Well, I, I don't necessarily see this group doing that. I mean, if they identify a problem, then I think it's up to that state agency to work out that problem. Uh, I mean, it, this is not... Right, but part of this, this executive director's responsibility is to help with best practices and stuff. So you have to identify what the problem is before you can recommend yeah, best practices. Yeah, you can even uh, uh, drill down to individual incidents without identifying individuals. I mean, I think, you know, if you're getting into an issue with respect to an individual employee or somebody who is serviced by an agency that's really in the, the, it's really under that agency's responsibility to address that very individual issue. 
I mean, we're talking about one person. They're not going to have the, yeah. the time to do an agency by agency look at in individual issues. I don't see that. It, it, it's not what. Right. It's not about individual discrimination. The numbers would jump in. Right, right. I, I get that part as far as, as addressing, but I'm just, again, just trying to figure out how far are they going to be able to <coughs> drill down to come up with what the solution or what the problem is. Um, we can move on. I'll just think about it a little bit here. <laughs> So where are we, folks? Change the language. <laughs> but how? To may, change shall to may, and then end in for me, at the end of the sentence you would have, uh, in accordance with that law. Or as permitted by law. Or as permitted, law. permitted by, by law. law. Yeah. Folks, are you OK with that? Yes. To mm -hmm. be in the next draft? So Brain, you got that? may provide the director with access to all relevant records and information as permitted by law. Sounds good to folks? Okay. What's the next thing on the list there, John? Uh, next issue was, I think we might, the next one was sort of tied to this one. Public records need to put confidentiality clause in the bill. That, that's what I, it's sort of around the same. <laughs> issue of gathering these records? Uh, it's really, uh, the, the issue that um, that I raised was whatever records, so you may get materials that are not legally protected from disclosing from one branch to another, but they may be work product, original work product notes, voicemails, any kind of correspondence for any state agency, you always have to decide whether or to what extent any of their work product or any of the materials they receive are subject to public records law. Presumptively, they all are. Um, and if you think that some of the materials that might be received or created by the panel or the executive officer would not, should not be presumptively produced, then this would be so either this or in a, a companion bill to amend the Public Record Act, you would want to address that. That's true for any, it's not unique to this position, that's true for any government position. And I don't, I mean, I'm not here to offer a view about that. It's really what you, what you envis envision. Um, because I don't know what, I mean, it's, their Supreme Court looked at cases about personal devices and email and all of that sort of stuff. So there's a strong presumption that everything would be disclosed, and it's a statutory exemption that would restrict that disclosure, and, and you are the statute folks. So that's why I'm raising it for you, too. So, so I'm sorry to be denser in a box of rocks at this okay. point, but is what you're saying is that the possibility would be out there once this were established, this panel with this structure, that there could be a public records request made of documents received from wherever on whatever topic. So the right. way uh, anybody can make a public records request to, say, the Agency of Education on fill in the blank. That's one whatever. example. That's, that's the kind of thing. That's not just the kind of thing. Another could be that because they have access to information, uh, I would expect that the, the executive officer of the panel might talk to state employees or even perhaps to students um, or, and get information from them that's not part of a record that's produced. And those individuals in my world, when I investigate civil rights, alleged civil rights violations, people often say, is what I'm about, or what I just told you, is that confidential? Or is this going to end up in the newspaper? Right. And we have a statute that says, absence of court order or your consent, it remains confidential. I don't know what the answer would be for the, this individual if they were talking about, we're talking to state employees about where they, they see racism. Those individuals may request confidentiality, and I'm not sure right now whether they could give it um, and 
and, and you know, it, it could be that there's something else in the Public Records Act, as I, I kind of disclaimed earlier, I'm not our office public records expert, um, but it is something that when you're looking at issues like that, you may well have individuals who are employees who might fear retaliation. Um, so the officer, whoever it is, on day one is, is going to have to know whether he or she, maybe even before they accept the job, as to whether that they may get information from sources that um, you know would not be forthcoming. Or, you know, they just need to know what the limits are, what they can um, promise or not promise if confidential sources are coming. Plus drafts. Let's say they're generating drafts and work product. Um, is that privileged or not? It might be. Or I mean, it, it depends if the, the person's offering. A, if they're a lawyer and they're providing a legal analysis, I'm not sure. I'm just saying right now there, it's not addressed at all, and I don't think there's a default answer in absence of one being provided on the page. I, so that's, that's what I was raising. So, Brian, previously when we had a list from the AG's office of potential problems, you were able to provide us a workaround. It, does some, anything come to mind that can help in with regard to language that might be added in to, to deal with this kind of situation? Yeah, I can work on that, absolutely. I don't have anything right now, mm -hmm. but I can certainly work on it. Uh, John? The Human Rights Commission does have a disclosure and confidentiality section to its authorizing so section. That Many agencies do. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's a little, it's not, totally relevant to this issue because it deals with investigative files and complaints, which is not what not this group's doing, but at least it's it's a starting point. Um, I think we can, I think we can Something. come up with some language. Um, so that can give some, <coughs> yeah. it's, it's springboard. Right. So committee, are, are we okay with Bryn working, working on some sort of language to show us? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and the Human Rights Commission has something that can be a starting point. Jessica? I, and honestly, it's a great point because remember one of the very first people who testified, I remember, talked about doing a report where they would interview people mm -hmm. and then that would help to establish some initial, uh, some of their initial work. So this will be incredibly important to have this, um, for them to know how far, what they can say they can keep confidential. Yeah. Next. Um, the next one was um, conflict between um, the officer and agencies. And I think we've slightly resolved this with the, right. the, the language with respect to the documents. But is that? I think that's right. I mean, the, the conflict that I was really talking about is if there's a dispute about what you shall have access to, what you can have access to. So I think, I mean, that was really the conflict that I, I, I um, anticipated here. So, so that's sure. John, um, next? The next one was, it was more of a question from Julio, which is, do we want to spell out the duties of the officer? Which we have yeah, already mentioned that to you. Okay. Well, there are there duties are listed, but, you know, for example, Julio's thing should, I think it's not, not the duties of the officer, but the, um, the qualifications um, of the officer. Yeah. For example, should the officer have a quantitative background, I think was the example Julio gave. To analyze data, because that's one of you know potentially one of their jobs. Uh, well, one of the questions I have around around that is, um, you know, this talks about working collaboratively, mm -hmm. but who will ultimately set the priorities here? That's will it be the governor? Will it be this council? Um, and. What if there's a conflict between the two? Uh, how does that get resolved? Who resolves it? Um, well, the panel's advisory. I'm not going to receive you. It can only advise the governor. Mm -hmm. So. You're advising the governor or the executive director? No, it, both. Right. So it advises. So the panel doesn't have. Determining the authority. The tell the governor what he should or should not do. And the officer <coughs> reports.
directly or indirectly to the governor. Where, 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 where does it say that they're only advisory? Right. Here it is. Um, is it page? So it's under duties, John, of the executive office? Is it page Directly. four on page five? Yeah, no, it's on page five, um, mm -hmm. line six and seven. Page five, five. Zero, zero, three. Is that the same? Six and seven are crossed out. It's, I have a line that well, it shows not change. At the top of page five. Yes. Also, it is titled, the title of the panel is an advisory panel. It says, advise the director to ensure ongoing compliance with the purpose of this chapter and advise the governor on mm -hmm. remediating systemic racial disparities in statewide systems of government. Okay, okay. Yeah. so we're on top of page five. Yeah. Section two. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> when we did the ethics. It's not ethics. That's an independent. No, but report. I was just thinking, did we decide what the um, qualifications of the person we did not to be? Okay. We didn't, we didn't say you had to be. Is it Where? What page is it that has the. Hold that, up the computer. Yeah. I think it continues on the top of page six. Create a strategy, develop a model. It actually starts talking about the panel on page two, at least on my version. Racial Equity Advisory Panel and everything below. No, it establishes it on page two. Right, and then it works the. Then it creates. Uh, creates. Just Well, we're well, kicking it off. Are, are we wed to the name as far as having racial in it? Um, that heard a suggestion was diversity. Earlier, racial diversity, or no, it was just plain diversity. Oh, not yeah, I was looking back some of the notes, and uh, one of them suggested was chief equity officer. I don't know if we want to do chief or executive director of equity. Um, that if from some of the advocacy they were suggesting, I've heard mitigation, but. Um, I mean, equity is, isn't that what it's all about? Diversity. Mm -hmm. Diversity, right. Um, but it may open the way to broadening that role in the future if, if we wanted to do that. Be more collaborative. Well, there's a whole question. I understand what everybody's saying. There's. There's also a question as to how far we're we going to go from the original intention of this bill before we send it back. If, if, if the goal is to, to remove any reference to race, I that's think that that's a real problem. That's going to be a problem. Because that's yeah. the whole point of this bill in the first place, systemic well, racism. I don't, I don't mean yes. to blow this up, but nobody has yet been able to explain to me or quantify just how pervasive and how large of a problem this is yet. We're going to find out. Yeah, so we're going on a fact finding fishing expedition. There's information in the Act 54 study. Mm hmm. That's quite the study. Or the report from the Human Rights Commission. You may have here an example of reasonable people uh, coming to different conclusions. I did read Act 54. Yeah. One second. If I could, the thing I was trying to I found for myself what I was trying to help get help on here. Going back to the concern about who, uh, concern Julio raised about qualifications for for the ED. Uh, what page is this? Page eight. Um, the panel shall submit to the governor the names. Oh, wait a minute. From applications for the position of executive director of racial equality, as many candidates as it deems qualified for the position. Julio saying qualified for the position sure doesn't do anything. Um, 
I mean, without any further detail, you're leaving to the panelists what they consider to be qualified. Um, and there could be, you know, disagreement about that. So if the legislature has a view that, I mean, there are benefits to having someone with those skills. I'm not saying they couldn't be outweighed by other attributes, but it seemed, I mean, the prior version, there was a, a consultant to do that, so. So we had Dennis and Jim. So one of the first days we discussed this, we heard from the uh, lady, the uh, Human Rights Commission, that they, they address these issues and gather a lot of information. We also heard from some agency heads, departments heads, that they within their own agencies also have a person, whether it's through HR or wherever it's coming from, they also have a person that's gathering data in responding to these issues and stuff. Liaison. What's that? It was a liaison. Liaison, okay. Uh, so, you know, I'm not saying we don't have a problem, I'm just not sure, but it looked like they're, they have been aware of some issues and they're, they've tried to deal with it within those uh, agencies uh, and stuff. Uh, I didn't hear any of them said that we needed more, uh, more people uh, spend another, you know, to create another position to to look into it, but I, I may be wrong. Some agencies are addressing it. Mm -hmm. What's that? Some agencies have addressed it. Right. I mean, but we could be asking all the agencies if, they, if they're not addressing it. I would hope that they're all addressing it. I... Well, what we heard was that some have some really good best practices that are embedded, and that's not the case across the board. Anyway, I should... Uh, Jim? Yeah, I... I don't want to belabor the position title. I'm very flexible. I was just reading from the suggestion that I, Chief Equity, came from Diana Wall, Wall that, that had testified before us. And, but and what was that? That was the lady from Brattleboro, right? Yes. Yeah, yes, and she said perhaps Chief Equity Officer describes it better. Um, the chief civil rights officer. Yeah, I, I, she, uh, she goes on to say that she thought, um, you know, while everybody might understand what chief civil rights officer, but focusing on discrimination, racial has fared in other work settings, this approach is well known and sadly has all too frequently not succeeded. A, a highly qualified person of color is appointed and expected to solve the institution's issues. What evolves is they do not have enough backup or authority and end up resigning in frustration. So uh, I just throw that out there for its worth. I know that we, and I, I'm not sure I could find it, but I know we got a lot of emails suggesting we change the title at one point. Um, we did. We did check. <coughs> it's so about civil rights. Civil rights was the original mm -hmm. title, and that okay. Yeah, it was yeah. mitigation. And then we got many. So, uh, Julio, we've got a question here directly. Sure. From you. Yeah. Um, Julio, what's your official title with the AG's office? Uh, I'm an assistant attorney general who's director of the civil rights unit. Just short. Our so, duties include more than so. Equity tends to deal with. Me equal protection or equal treatment, but civil rights, and like in my role, covers issues like First Amendment, which is beyond the scope of here. So civil rights has, there are due process, search and seizure, those are issues that are not necessarily related to equal protection. So it would be your job to defend the state? Yeah. If it, if it no, it's to prosecute? We enforce state laws um, and or Yes, we defend, we, uh, we enforce both state and federal constitutional laws, so um, travel bans up for argument for Supreme Court this week, we are involved in. But if the state was to find themselves in the position of having to be a defendant in a case like this, would your office be defend them? The Attorney General's office, but not the Civil Rights Unit. We have a civil division that defends the state litigation. For Human Rights Commission, we have an administrative section that deals with administrative investigations. We don't work on those cases, and they don't work on our cases. Okay, so you would have any idea how many times the state's been involved and embroiled in a situation like this? 
What, in what situation is that? In a civil rights situation. I don't have any numbers for that now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Julio before we can let him go? He likes it here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not that much. Mm -hmm. Okay. And thank you, Julio. <coughs> Um, Beth, while you're here right now, did you want to talk with us? No, just listening? So, committee, are there other things that you want to... Thank you very much, William. Are there other things, committee, that you want to um, toss in Bryn's direction for the next draft? Oh, Beth? Um, Tom Alman did already mention this morning that the administration is, we are working on an executive order. Mm -hmm. um, he already, I, I thought he already mentioned that. I didn't yeah. think I needed to say it again. <laughs> okay.